All right. Section four of chapter one is all about economics as a science. So in an earlier video, I talked a little bit about how economics is a science. Uh, it's a social science, um, but uh, it does employ the same methodologies used in other sciences, such as biology, chemistry, physics, uh, etc. We use the scientific method uh, to investigate uh, the questions that are of interest to us as economists. So um, similarly to these other types of sciences too, we use models to explain uh, phenomenon in the real world. Um, so just like there's uh, Newtonian physics, which is a model of uh, movement and um, uh, the movement of, of physical bodies, uh, we use models in economics as well uh, to describe people's behavior. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about what models are or, uh, or theories. Um, pretty much the same thing. All models are theories, but not all theories are models. There we go. Um, in any case, um, I'm sure uh, you've come across some things that are considered to be models in your own life. Uh, model cars, model planes, model trains, right? Um, now, of course, these aren't the real thing uh, that we have in real life, right? They're not real planes or real cars or real trains. Um, but what they are, are uh, simplified versions of the real world, right? Um, now, you could, in some instances, use those for making predictions or providing explanations, um, but that's exactly what we do with economic models, right? They are simplified versions of reality, and they are simplified um, so that they're easy to use, but they're not so simple and basic that they don't make good predictions or explain what's really going on in the real world. They have enough of the pertinent uh, information built into them so that they can explain what's actually going on in the real world, even though it's not um, an exact depiction of the re real world. The real world is messy. It's complicated. Um, so if our models were messy and complicated, they'd be hard to use. That's why they, they're they simplified versions, right? So um, because of this, good models really should capture only the essential features or relationships that are enough to analyze a particular problem. Um, and it's not really valid to fault them as unrealistic simply because they don't capture all the details, right? So think about a map. That is a quintessential model of a geographic location, um, but in no way uh, can we really fault it for being unrealistic? In fact, um, it is realistic enough to provide us with the essential features that are important for um, addressing the problem, right? A map tell, helps us determine where to go. Um, and so we only need the most fundamental features of the geographic location um, to allow us to navigate, right? So that's the idea there. Um, so simple so that they're easy to use, but with enough information that they help us achieve what we're trying to do. They help us try to, uh, they help us to solve the problem we're trying to solve, right? So that's the gist of, of what a model is. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing in this class is we're going to be building various economic models and they are in no way exact depictions of the real world, but they are uh, simplified versions that um, are easy to work with but still give us good predictions or good explanations of what's going on in the real world. Now, all models involve assumptions, um, and that's just a set of circumstances in which the model is applicable. So if the assumption is invalid, we can't apply the model to that particular situation. But if the assumptions are valid, then we can apply our models. So one assumption we've already talked about is the rational self-interested assumption. So as long as that assumption holds, we can use economic models to uh, analyze behavior or decisions or other economic problems. Um, if there are any instances or scenarios in which that rationality assumption does not hold, then our models are not going to work because that's uh, an assumption that those models are built on, right? It's kind of like a foundation in a sense. If that foundation doesn't exist, the model isn't going to be able to stand up and, and do its job.
Um, but nevertheless, every single model or theory has to be built on some set of assumptions um, because we're simplifying things away from the complicated mess of reality. All right, so uh, just going back to our example of the map, right, getting directions, um, a map is a simplified model of reality. Um, now, the degree of simplification will vary across different types of maps. So some maps have more details than others, but they all have the essential feature that allows uh, one to use it to uh, help themselves get around, right, to find uh, the direction to in, into which they need to go. Um, so as far as economic models are concerned, they focus on what is relative, rel, uh, relevant, sorry, relevant to the problem at hand, and they uh, ignore what's not relevant, right? So um, just as, as an example regarding maps, um, we don't necessarily need to know what kind of material the road is made out of. Um, Roads are made out of asphalt, concrete, dirt, um, gravel, right? These are all different types of roads, but we don't necessarily need that information for the map to help us get where we're trying to go, right? So that's, that's information that can be left out and that makes it simpler and it also makes it easier to work with. Um, now, there may be some instances in which you want that information, right? Maybe you've got a vehicle that cannot travel on a dirt road. In which case that information is is relevant to the problem uh, and you would want to have that in that information in the model of the map right so um we'll talk about this more as we go through the entire course because everything we're doing in this course is building different models of economic decision making um now there is one important assumption that we make in economics and in most sciences um and that's something called the Ceteris Paribus Assumption. Um, and I'll explain more about why this uh, assumption is so important. Uh, but for now, um, understand that basically what Ceteris Paribus means, um, it's a Latin phrase that basically means um, that other things are held constant or other things are held equal. Uh, and what that means is that nothing changes except for the factors being studied, uh, the factor or factors. Um, so I'll give you an example. If we were to build a model airplane, um, a paper plane, right? Um, and we wanted to look at the effect of uh, the weight of the paper uh, on how far it flies, um, we wouldn't want to also simultaneously change, say, the design of the paper airplane um, or... Um, test our two different versions in different uh, wind speed environments, right? If we're looking, if we're trying to study how the effect of the weight of the paper, uh, say we're using printer paper for one and construction paper for another, so construction paper is heavier, uh, we'd want to use the exact same um, folding design. We'd want to do it in an environment uh, where the wind speed and direction is the same. Um, so. We're, we're holding everything constant except for the weight of the paper that we're using. So uh, that's an example of, of Keteris, the Keteris Paribus assumption. Um, and uh, the reason for it is so that we can focus in on the particular aspect that we're interested in and determine the effect it has on the outcome we're looking at, which in this case would be how far the paper airplane can fly. Um, so that's a very important assumption that we're going to uh, continue to see throughout the course. Um, now, as far as economics as a science, we need to understand that it is an empirical science. And what empirical means is that we use real world data to evaluate the usefulness of our models. Um, data being the key point here with, with regard to empirical. So empirical basically means that we use observations uh, from the real world. We use data from the real world that come from our observations. Um, now, our models will only be useful insofar as they are able to predict economic phenomena, people's decisions, firms' decisions, etc. Um, so economic models basically predict how people or firms or other organizations react or act. Uh, they model and predict the, the way that they make their decisions. But w 
what we are not doing is modeling how people or businesses think, right? So there's an interesting difference there. Um, so we'll see this very clearly in, uh, for those of you that are in micro, uh, in the chapter on consumer choice. Um, and we'll also see this for those of you that taking, are taking macro um, in other places as well. Um, and I'll try to point those distinctions out as we go along, but particularly in consumer choice, we'll learn about utility theory and utility maximization theory. Um, and we will see very clearly there that what we learn in that chapter is in no way, shape or form how people think, but it does very accurately describe how people act. Okay. So that is the difference there. Um, if you want to take a class that models how people think, uh, you should take a psychology class. And there are a lot of um, similarities and ties between economics and psychology. But that is one major difference is that we are modeling how people act, not how they think. Okay, we do not. We're not modeling how people think. That's a that's a subject for psychology. Um, now, throughout the term, we will look at a lot of behavioral uh, economics examples. Um, and this is one of those, uh, branches of economics that is sort of at the forefront of the science. Um, it's sort of the most, uh, uh, up to date version of economics. Um, but it's basically an approach of studying, uh, behavior, not just consumer behavior, uh, although that's what the slide says, but also firm behavior and other types of behavior. But um, the key aspect of behavioral economics is that it focuses on the psychological limitations that decision makers may face when uh, making a decision and, and how these psychological limitations might interfere with rational, self-interested decision making. Um, so people, uh, economists and proponents of behavioral economics, people that believe in behavioral economics, they believe that it's unrealistic to assume that we are um, unboundedly selfish. Okay, so this shouldn't be hard to realize, right? Again, we give to charity, we give to homeless people, so we're not entirely selfish beings, at least most of us are not. Um, they also assume, they, uh, they believe it's unrealistic to assume that we have unbounded willpower and that we have unbounded rationality, that we can... Um, that we have all the willpower that we need to do what we want, right? We should be able to relate to this. Um, just last night, I had a huge bag of candy that uh, later on I wish I hadn't had. And so I didn't really have the willpower to achieve what I wanted to, which was not eating the entire bag of candy. Um, as far as unbounded rationality goes, um, we are not able to analyze every single available alternative out there uh, that, that is available to us, right? Um, we can only we only have the brain power and the, uh, the wherewithal to analyze a certain set of options. We can't analyze every single option out there. We don't know what all the options are. We look at the options that are available to us and that we know about, um, and we analyze them as best as we can. So that's the idea behind, um, what's called bounded rationality. The fact that we can't consider all of our choices, um, we can only uh, consider those that we're aware of. And, and furthermore, um, we don't necessarily have all the information regarding those those alternatives. So that's another aspect of bounded rationality. So we'll talk about behavioral economics more. It's pretty interesting stuff. Um, and to wrap up this section, we'll talk a little bit more about exactly what bounded rationality is. But again, I just described it to a large extent. We can't uh, examine every single choice that is available to us. Um, and in many cases, uh, perhaps in most cases, we use uh, rules of thumb to sort of sort alternatives. So if you've ever been to a restaurant, a new restaurant that you've never been to before, you've never seen the menu, um, you are probably familiar with using rules of thumb to sort of sort through the alternatives on the menu, right? Um, you might think, well, I don't really like to eat salad, so I don't even look at the salad section. Um, I generally don't eat appetizers, so I'll skip that. I, I generally go to uh, like a sandwich sandwich section or a burger section, sort of look through those. Um, I don't like eating a lot of chicken, so I'll skip over items that have chicken in them. Um, these are all rules of thumb that I personally use when looking at a menu that I'm not familiar with, right? So 
Um, these are examples of, of bounded rationality. Uh, and that concludes uh, section four of chapter one. I will see you in the next video for section five.